crucial step in the growth of GNU, Linux, and the free software movement was the creation of businesses based upon the software and philosophy. Ground zero for the beginning of the business phase was the Electronics Research Lab at Stanford University. Known as ERL, the lab was the place where the first GNU and Linux businesses found their inspiration. So right here is where ERL was. That would have been the entrance over there next to the uh, Electrical Engineering McCullough Building. If you walk in, you come in, you walk down the hallway down here. My office would have been about, about here. And then right across the hall from that was Michael Tiemann's office. Michael Tiemann took uh, and started a company, Cygnus Software, but the idea was to sell consulting and services around the GNU free software. And, well, Michael's done very well with Cygnus. Well, uh, I spent a lot of time working out uh, how we were going to make money, and in the original GNU manifesto, which is the last chapter of the GNU Emacs manual, Stallman proposed a number of different possible ways to make money. From the beginning of the free software movement, I've had the idea that there's room in it for business to be done. One of the advantages of free software is that there's a free market for any kind of service or support. So if you are using software in your business and you want good support, you have a choice of people to go to for it. You have a choice of businesses that are in the business of providing you with support. So they're going to have to, in general, give you good support or you'll go to somebody else. With proprietary software, support is a monopoly. There's one company, typically, that has the source code, and only they can give you support. So, typically, you're at the mercy of a monopoly. That's the case, for example, with Microsoft. So, no wonder the support is so bad. The benefits of free software were tremendous, but the cost of supporting it internally uh, made managers very, very nervous. And so the, f the fundamental idea I had was if we could build a model that could deliver two to four times the support and, uh, and, uh, and hand-holding capability that an internal engineer could provide, and we could do it at one-half to one-quarter of the cost, that would meet the test of whether or not people would actually buy. And by about the fall of that year, we had all of the things worked out about who we needed on the technical team, what the terms of the sale would be, what the key price points were, and we actually received our incorporation in November of 1989. One of the most difficult things in starting our company was actually finding a name for it. I explained this to one of my friends, we were having difficulty, and he returned an email message that basically just had a bunch of words with the name GNU in it. And Cygnus was the one that looked least uh, obnoxious and least obscene. I can say very clearly that Cygnus was the first business that specialized in free software. Cygnus supported free software, filled a very essential niche because we had this great software. You could get it for nothing, but you couldn't get support, and they made their money by charging for support. The GNU project started by building a toolkit of basic development tools such as a C compiler, a debugger, a text editor, and uh, other necessary apparatus and their intention was eventually to develop a kernel to sit underneath those and be the center of the operating system. By about 1990, they had successfully developed that toolkit, and it was w in wide use on a great many variants of, of Unix, but there was still no free kernel. The kernel happened to be one of the last things we started to do, and we had started it not long before. And that's when Linus Torvalds came along. Linus or Linus? What's exactly your preferred pronunciation? Uh, when I speak Swedish, it's Linus. When I speak Finnish, it's Linus. When I speak English, it's Linus. And I really don't care how people pronounce my name. But Linux is always Linux. He developed a kernel and got it working faster than we got ours working and got it to work very nicely and solidly. His kernel is called Linux. The initial goal was my very personal goal to be able to run a similar environment on my computer that I had grown used to at, at the university computers. And I could not find anything that suited me for that. Right? So having been doing computers for all my life, basically, at that point I just decided that I'll do my own. Um, most of the inspiration early on came from from Sun OS, which was what um, I was using at the university at the time. Which university? University of Helsinki, Finland.
from 1991 to about 1993 was really, I guess, the infancy period of Linux. That was when it was still only alpha or beta quality. It was relatively unstable. Although, even then, it was a good deal more stable than a lot of what are now called production operating systems. Linus used the traditional tried and true method of writing one program that does the job, and he got it to work quickly, in fact, faster than I would have thought was possible. The, the term for it is monolithic, which means that basically the OS itself is one entity, indivisible, um, while in a microkernel, a, the, the operating system kernel is actually uh, just a collection of servers that do different things and then they have a common protocol for doing communication between themselves. So why is it that if, if the GNU project had, had so much lead time to speak doing this, why, was, why is it that he was able to kind of come in at the tail end? Well, so to speak? we actually started the GNU herd not long before he started Linux. And as it happened, though, we chose a design that's a very advanced design in terms of the power it gives you, but also turns out to be very hard to debug. It, we decided to divide up the kernel, which traditionally had been one program, to divide it up into a lot of smaller programs that would send messages to each other asynchronously to, to communicate. And the problem is that that style of programming has a great deal of potential for bugs, which are often very hard to figure out because they depend on does this, mess send, does this program send this message before or after this one sends that message, and the result was it took us years to get the thing to work. What is Linux's relationship to the GNU project? Well, there's there's relationships to, to GNU on kind of multiple levels. One is just the philosophical level of, of thinking that making your source open is a good idea. When Linus developed the kernel, he wasn't doing it for the GNU project. He did it independently. And he released it independently, and we didn't know about it. But some of the people who did know about it decided to look for what else they could find to put together with that kernel to make a whole system. And they looked around, and lo and behold, everything they needed was already available. What good fortune, they thought, but actually there was no chance about it. They had found all the pieces of the GNU system which was missing just the kernel. So when they put all that together, really they were fitting Linux into the gap in the GNU system, but they didn't know that. There's a lot of these programs um, done by the Free Software Foundation and done by other people like Linux, and there's a symbiosis between Linux and the programs so that the programs run on Linux and at the same time and they take advantage of Linux as a platform while Linux takes advantage of the programs by just being able to use them. What, what programs? Um, for the, the main one is actually the GNU C compiler which without a C compiler it would not have been possible to to make Linux or most of, of the open programs available. Uh, Linux uses the GPL and I agree with the kind of philosophy behind the GPL. Uh, that said, the GPL itself is, is not a very pretty document, which is probably just because uh, no lawyers can ever be very pretty. Well, I've been playing around with Linux for actually late 92, early 93 for about a year before I decided it was to the point where it actually had everything that I needed to really replace the Sun workstation. And I was looking for a way to have a Unix workstation at home. At the time, we used Sun Spark stations in the office at Stanford. Those machines cost us about $7,000. Now, I desperately wanted a Unix machine at home. There's always this thought you get as a graduate student, gee, if I could work at home, then I would be so much more productive, I would graduate sooner because I would finish my thesis sooner. Well, well is, it, is it true? Well, you can judge, you know. Uh, uh, most people end up spending a lot of their time becoming more productive so that if they ever actually worked on their thesis, they'd finish it in a day.
it takes a while sometimes. So I decided I wanted a Unix machine at home. And I went out there and was able to use Linux together with a PC for about $2,000. I put together a system that was one and a half to two times faster than that $7,000 SunSpark station. That was absolutely amazing. I had one and a half to two times the speed at a third to a fourth the price. Light bulbs went off. I knew there was an opportunity here. This was a chance to, to really do something better than what Sun has done around open source and Linux.